Well, we've been in a series since January called Naked and Unashamed. Thanks for hanging in there with me. We've got two more weeks. We've got this week and then next week uh, we're going to do a wrap up where we're going to look at a vision and some affirmations. Uh, but this week I want to talk to you about the whole idea of gender and transgenderism. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but transgender has suddenly become a big issue in our culture. I mean, until recently, transgender was a topic that barely registered on most people's radar. But quite suddenly, transgender and gender issues have become front and center. Time magazine said transgender is the next civil rights frontier. So just before we dive in and just before we look at the whole issue of gender and transgender, I want to remind you of some definitions which will be helpful this morning. First one is gender identity. Gender identity is one's internal sense of being male or female or neither of these or both or another gender. All of us, every one of us has a gender identity. For some of us, the sex assigned at birth and our own internal sense of gender identity are not the same. Second definition, gender expression. Gender expression refers to how someone expresses their gender identity. It's the physical manifestation of one's gender identity through dress, through actions, through their voice, etc. The way we express our gender identity varies from culture to culture. Each culture has its own gender norms of what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine. Then you have sex assigned at birth. That's kind of self-explanatory. It's just your biological sex. When you were born, Dr. Grab just smacked you in the butt and said, boy or girl, right? And then there's transgender. Here's the definition of transgender. Transgender is a term used to describe people whose gender identity differs from the sex the doctor marked on their birth certificate. Gender dysphoria is when a person experiences distress, inner anguish, or discomfort from sensing a conflict between their gender identity and their biological sex. That person is experiencing gender dysphoria. And the question I want us to look at this morning is, how do we relate to people whose experience of their gender doesn't fit their biological sex? How do we relate to people who have changed their biological sex? How do we relate to transgender people or people that are experiencing gender dysphoria? Well, I would suggest to you as Christ followers, we relate to them the same way we relate to people that are gay or lesbian. We relate to them in love. Let me remind you of what Jesus said. I read this a couple of weeks ago, but let me remind you of what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Jesus summarized all the commandments into two. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We're to love God with everything we have. Then we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Thus, we are to love transgendered people as ourselves. But what does that look like? What does it look like to love a transgendered person? Well, let me give you several thoughts around that. The first is this. We're to love transgendered people with a love that acknowledges the reality and the impact of the fall. I want us to go over to Matthew 19 for a few minutes. And uh, the passage I'm about to read is a conversation Jesus had with some religious leaders around divorce and remarriage. It's not about gender. 
But there are two bits of wisdom in this passage that are helpful for our discussion today. Here's Matthew 19, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judah to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. As Jesus answered this question on divorce, and there's a lot in this passage, He gives us two helpful pieces of advice for dealing with gender issues. The first piece of advice is found in verse 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female. There are males and there are females. God did not create a genderless human. There is not a spectrum. There is male and female. God created a complementary pair, male and female. Humanity is sexed. It's how God created us. Notice Jesus says, haven't you read? In other words, what's wrong with you? Don't you understand? This is pretty simple. There are males and females. The second bit of wisdom is found in verse 12, where it says this. For there are eunuchs who are born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, for there are eunuchs who are born that way. Now, a eunuch is a genetic male who doesn't have sex organs to go with their gender identity. And Jesus says here, some people are born eunuchs. Do you notice the tension here? Jesus says that yes, God made the male and female. But then Jesus also says, but some people are born who are exceptions to that rule. Now Jesus is not saying eunuchs are intersex or transgender. The point is Jesus is saying there are exceptions. A few people don't fit into the categories by no fault of their own. They were born that way. Whether they are eunuchs or whether they're intersex or whether they're people struggling with gender dysphoria, through no fault of their own, a few people don't fit the categories. They are born that way. And a logical question to ask is, well, if God created male and female, but some are born who are exceptions, why are they born that way? They're born that way because we live in a fallen world. We live in a Genesis 3 world, not a Genesis 1-2 world. Thus, our hearts and our minds and our bodies, while beautiful things, are also broken things. Gender dysphoria is a result of living in a fallen world in a fallen body. And please, please understand, a person who thinks he or she is 
or should be or feel, would feel better as the gender that is the opposite of their own biological sex is experiencing a real and the genuine and an unchosen experience. It's not something they can just get over. Thus, for us to effectively love transgendered people, we need to understand the impact of the fall on our hearts and on our minds and on our bodies. Let me say secondly, that we're to love transgendered people with a love that is full, that is full of dignity and respect. Let, let me read you a verse that I've read several times in this series, Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Every single person bears God's image. There are no exception clauses to that. Yes, that image is profoundly marred, but nevertheless, every person bears God's image. Thus, every person, every person is worthy of dignity and respect. Which means, as Christ followers, we need to remember road sign number one from our first sermon in this series. And that road sign said, no negative labeling. Labels devalue people. Labels disrespect people. Labels make it okay not to love certain people. Labels make us shut down any chance of a meaningful conversation. We must not. As Christ followers, we must not negatively label people struggling with gender issues. And we must, we must, as Christ followers, outright reject any mocking, demeaning humor, abuse, or bullying of people struggling with gender issues. 45% of transgender teens attempt suicide. 45%. I don't comprehend their inner torment, but they're not making it up. They need our love, not our rejection. Amen? Which leads me to the next point. We're to love transgendered people with a love that embraces and accepts. We're to love transgendered people with that prodigal father love. Remember the series from the fall on the prodigal father? The son, son's coming home and the father runs out and he wraps his arms around his son and he loves him and he embraces him and he accepts him. Folks, that's the posture that we as Christ followers need to have towards transgender people, people struggling with gender dysphoria. We need to wrap our arms around them and we need to love them. We need to accept them. We need to embrace them. We should respond to transgender people by saying, God loves you. We love you and you are welcome here. Tell us, what is it like to be you? What is it like to live in your shoes? Because we don't know what it's like to live in your shoes. How can we love you? How can we serve you? How can we journey with you? That needs to be our posture. Which leads me to the next point. We're to love transgender people with a love that is willing to journey with them. Let me remind you that every single one of us is on a journey. And every one of us is on different places on that journey. I was thinking this week, that one of the most beautiful things about Christianity is that we have a patient God. We have a patient God. I mean, think about how patient God has been with you. When I think about how patient God has been with me, I, I, I'm just awestruck at his patience. And, and if he is patient with us, then we as his followers need to be patient with others. And we need to be patient as we walk along those, aside those who are experiencing gender dysphoria. As we walk alongside those who are struggling with gender dysphoria, we need to be patient. We need to encourage them. We need to cheer them on. We need to walk with them. 
We need, we need to walk alongside people experiencing trend or dysphoria like we would anyone else. We walk along. So we walk alongside people who are experiencing mental health issues and emotional health issues and physical health issues all the time. And we walk alongside with them with great love and great grace and great care. And we cheer them on. We point them to hope. And we need to do the same thing with transgender people. We need to journey with them and point them to the hope and let God do his work. And we need to be patient about that. And then we need to love transgender people with a love that is counter-cultural. Let me explain. Let me remind you of the secular narrative which dominates our culture today. The secular narrative that dominates our culture today says that there is no God. It doesn't include God. The secular narrative puts self at the center and here's a key point for us. The secular narrative divides the person. Just like the ancient Gnostics, we have, in our culture today, divided a person into true. We say the body is here, and we say your thoughts and your feelings and your desires over here. And your thoughts and your feelings and your desires, we say today, are more important than your body. Just like the ancient Gnostics did. Today we're told that the authentic self... The real self has no real connection to the physical body. Today what matters is not our physical bodies. Today what matters, we're told over and over, is your thoughts and your feelings and your desires. Thus what counts today is not whether you are biologically male or female. What counts are your thoughts and your feelings and your desires around gender. And that leads people to conclude that their gender identity can be totally disconnected from their bodies. Because the priority is given to your thoughts and your desires and your feelings. The biblical narrative is an exact opposite contrast to the secular narrative. You couldn't get two things that are more diametrically opposed. Where the secular narrative says there is no God, the biblical narrative includes God. Where the secular narrative says self is at the center, the biblical narrative puts God right at the center. And where the secular narrative divides the person, the biblical narrative does not divide the person. The biblical narrative says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made with a body, with a soul, that's your inner person, your will, your mind, and your emotions, and with a spirit, that's the part that connects us with God. The biblical narrative says that neither the soul, nor the body, nor the spirit in themselves makes up a person. A person is a spirit, a soul, and a body. You were created to be a unified whole being, spirit, soul, and body. Do you see how the biblical narrative has a much, much higher view of the physical body than the secular narrative? It it also views people not as divided parts, but as integrated wholes. And that means Christianity has a different way, a vastly different way of journeying with transgender people. Whereas culture says the way to deal with the disconnect between the body and the mind is to align the body to the mind rather than aligning the mind to the body. And so what we do today in our culture is if I wanted to be a woman, my body would be changed to make me to look like a woman. I'd have surgery, I'd take hormones, etc. We change the body to fit the mind rather than mind to fit the body. But let me ask you a question. Is you feel something, let's make it physically true, always the best way to help someone? Is you feel something, let's make it physically true, always the best way to help someone? Several weeks I told you a story about a trans-abled blind woman named Jewel Shuppling. I don't know if you remember the story. 
if you weren't here or you don't remember, let me give you the quick synopsis of it. Jewel wanted to be blind. She had perfectly good eyesight, but she thought in her mind she should be blind. So in 2006, when Jewel was in her early 20s, she found a psychologist who was willing to help her. And he poured numbing eye drops into her eyes, and then he poured drain cleaner into her eyes. And after several treatments, she was blind. She wanted to be blind. Her body was perfectly sighted. So what they did was they destroyed her eyes to, so her body could be what her mind wanted it to be. Now, when you just either just heard my synopsis or you heard the longer version a few weeks ago, I'm sure you concluded that her thoughts and feelings were at odds with her reality. She was perfectly sighted, but she wanted to be blind. And you may have just thought to yourself, while Jewel had a real desire to be blind, and while she was certainly experiencing real distress, no one would deny that, destroying healthy organs to accommodate her misperceptions about herself was probably not the best course of action. A better course of action would have been to restore her mind rather than destroy her eyes. And I think probably most of us would agree with that. And yet when it comes to transgender people, culture says the best way to fix the issue is to fix the body, not the mind. And so the best way to fix the body is to alter a physically good body to fit what the mind says it should be. And I would suggest to you that Christianity has a much different perspective. Again, Christianity says that a person is an integrated whole. And thus, as Christ followers, we need to help people move towards wholeness, not brokenness. And yet today what's happening in our culture is we are celebrating and infirming and empowering people's brokenness. We say it's good for people to be divided, that thoughts, feelings, and desires are more important than the body. And so even though the body and a person and their thoughts are in conflict, are disconnected, disunified, what we do in our culture today is we celebrate that brokenness. And we say that's good you feel the way you are. Let us help your body match that. And so we celebrate, we affirm, we encourage in our culture today brokenness. But as Christ followers, we have a different answer. Rather than celebrating brokenness, we need to help people move towards wholeness. Because after all, Jesus came to redeem and restore, heal and transform what had been torn apart by sin. We should not celebrate what has been torn apart by sin. What we should do is help people find the wholeness that Jesus wants them to find. Amen? And so we need to love with a countercultural love. With a love that says, I love you so much that I won't celebrate your brokenness. It's a love that says, I love you so much that I want to help you journey in Jesus towards wholeness. And let me say this also when we talk about loving in a countercultural way, and I don't want you to misunderstand this. But let me say this. Unfortunately today, some are using gender issues to destroy the male-female binary. Some in our culture do have an agenda. Now let me be clear. Let me be clear here. Just because a few Muslims are terrorists doesn't mean all Muslims are terrorists, right? And just because a few nutbar Christians hold up signs saying God hates fags doesn't mean we all are in that camp, right? And so just because a few in the LGBTQ community have an agenda doesn't mean all in that community have an agenda by any means, right? Right? Thank you. Scared me there for a minute. But here's the truth. We do know there are activists that have an agenda. 
And today, children and teenagers live in a culture that prompts them to question their sexual identity as never before. Soji 1, 2, 3 in our school systems can be used to impose a view on children that says their physical bodies are irrelevant to who they really are. Do you realize how anti-biblical that is? Do you realize that? That isn't completely against what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches you're an integrated whole. The secular agenda is teaching that no kids, you're not a whole, you're a divided person. That is anti-biblical. The gender unicorn is clearly designed to appeal to young children to teach them that there is no unified self. The Bible teaches there is a unified self. Do you see the difference? There's a huge difference. And, And while... We don't expect unredeemed people to live by redeemed values, and we don't expect unredeemed people to live redeemed lives. I would suggest that Christians should speak up in positive, helpful, and appropriate ways. Notice the latter part of that statement. Christians should speak up in positive, helpful, and appropriate ways. And we should say that we don't believe for a second that it is wise good or healthy to tell little children that they can choose their gender. Because that is the opposite of what our God designed and the Bible teaches. But we need to speak up in appropriate ways. Listen, here's the deal. We need a real, deep, Christ-centered love. I want to say that again because it's so important. We need a real, deep, Christ-centered love that steers people towards wholeness from brokenness. And we need a real, deep, Christ-centered love that stands up for children because Jesus stood up for children. And here's the final one. We're to love transgender people with a love that points to a future hope. Listen, gender dysphoria is deep and it's painful and it's a struggle and it causes anguish and tears and heartache. And the good news of the gospel is that one day all pain and all struggle and all tears will be gone. Yet a person with gender dysphoria may not find total freedom in Jesus until either Jesus takes them to heaven or Jesus returns bringing heaven to earth. But in the meantime, as Christ followers, we need to point all people, all people towards our great future hope and towards the King of Kings, the one who gives us hope. I like what someone said. They said this. We live in a Genesis 3 world with a Genesis 1 blueprint on a trajectory to a Revelation 21 future. I like that. Let me close by saying this. The church, the church should be the place, the place where all people know they are loved and accepted. The church of Jesus Christ should be the place where all people, all people know that they are loved and accepted. A transgendered person should feel more loved and safe visiting a church than in any other place in the world. A gender dysphoric person should feel safer speaking about their identity and struggles in a church than anywhere else. But unfortunately... It's often anything but that. And if you're struggling with gender dysphoria, or you know somebody who's struggling with gender dysphoria, and they have found the church unwelcoming or distant or judgmental or harsh, then there's a problem. And and it's not with you if you're struggling with gender dysphoria and it's not with your friend who's struggling with it. It's with the church and I'm sorry. And if you're here and you're struggling with gender dysphoria, my plea to you is don't leave, help us do better. 
because we want to be a church that's known as a church that has a prodigal love for everyone. A church that opens its arms and wraps its arms around people, embracing them in the love and the grace and the acceptance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us on that journey. And if you experience rejection, if you're in the LGBTQ community, I'm going to talk more about this next week. I apologize for the way the church has rejected you. The church should be loving you, not rejecting you. Thank you.